we'll hear from our colleague, Olga Belagolova, who has many titles in this research community committed to countering influence operations. A policy manager for IO at Facebook, Olga has also served as a leading analyst and as a journalist. Right now, she teaches this a subject at Georgetown University with a popular class entitled Lies, Damn Lies, and Disinformation. Over to you, Olga. Thanks, Graham. And thanks so much for having me back at 360OS. It's wonderful to be here, and I look forward to the next time in person, hopefully. Uh, so I'm here to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is history. Because I wear two different hats, as an adjunct professor at Georgetown and as a policy manager at Facebook, I've gotten the chance to study the problem of influence operations from two different angles. At Georgetown, we normally start off the semester with a shared understanding of definitions and terms. Anyone who knows me knows that that is extremely important. But soon after, we dive right into history. Now, it, that isn't just the history of Cold War era active measures. It's also the history of how we all communicate with one another and how that has changed with, with emerging technologies from the printing press to radio, to television, to the internet. And how each technology has brought with it enormous societal change and enormous opportunity for deception from Martin Luther to Orson Welles to Don Draper to Yevgeny Prigozhin. In April 1900, American writer Mark Twain was asked to write a commemorative statement on the opening of the Gutenberg Museum in Germany. Here's an excerpt of what he wrote. It created a new and wonderful earth and along with it, a new hell. It found truth walking and gave it a pair of wings. It found falsehood trotting and gave it two pair. It found science hiding in corners and hunted. It has given it freedom of the land, the seas, the skies, and made it the world's welcome quest. It found the arts and occupations few, it multiplies them every year. It found the inventor shunned and despised, it has made him great and given him the globe for his estate. It found religion a master and an oppression, it has made it man's friend and benefactor. It found war comparatively cheap but inefficient, it made it dear but competent. It has set peoples free and other people it has enslaved. It is the father and protector of human liberty, and it has made despotisms possible where they were not possible before. Now, reading this today, it sounds like it could have been written about any range of modern communications technologies, mediums, or anything that we study and talk about today. Studying influence operations as they manifest in the digital domain today can feel new and exciting, as evidenced by the incredible community of research we've seen at this conference over the last few days. But one of the things my colleagues and I have seen at Facebook is that IO threat, threat actors that we track, particularly the sophisticated ones, are increasingly employing analog active measures techniques. As social media platforms, researchers, and governments continue to improve detection, deterrence, disruption, influence operators are pushing the boundaries of enforcement and going back to the tried and true techniques of the history books. Now let's walk through a couple of examples. Uh, I just want to make sure that the slides um, I prepared are um, shared. There we go. Perfect. So uh, let's go to the next slide right away. So the basis of this conversation is anchored in this graphic, which was created as a handout to support testimony by then Deputy Director for Intelligence at the CIA, Bob Gates, um, when he was appearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1985. Here you can see two forged letters. The top letter is from 1984, and it was forged to appear to be from US Ambassador Helene von Damme to Austrian Defense Minister. It is written in almost flawless German and looks to be asking the Austrians about the use of their early defense warning system for NATO, aiming to play on Austrian commitments to neutrality at the time. It was actually sent to the Australian, uh, Austrian Defense Ministry, and the Austrians shared this letter with the ambassador herself and said, what is this? You know, can you take a look? Is this true? The good news is that the governments work together to debunk this. And the even better news is that news outlets who received the forged letter at the time didn't publish it right away and ended up first fact checking the letter's veracity with both the Austrian and American embassies. At the bottom, you can see a forged letter attributed to US Senator Bob Corker from 2015 an address to then Ukrainian Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenuk. 
accusing the Ukrainian government of provoking ethnic tensions in Ukraine and criticizing its treatment of ethnic minorities. This forged letter was a part of an operation first exposed by Facebook investigators in May 2019 and dubbed secondary infection by DFR Lab and Graphica, who conducted wide range of research into this network's cross-platform proliferation across over 300 websites through the use of burner accounts, forgeries, and article placements. Like our 1984 story though, this operation wasn't particularly successful. Of this network's many attempts to inject its narratives into mainstream conversations, only one story managed to break through, and that was only after it was amplified by one of the top political figures in the UK ahead of the 2019 election. Next slide, please. So the next trend that we've seen across threat actors is article placement. The secondary infection case was just one of the recent examples where IO threat actors tried to seed stories into the press, placing articles into obscure publications with the hope that they would eventually get a wider reach. It was dubbed secondary infection by researchers at the time as it was reminiscent of one of the most well-trodden Cold War operations, Operation Infection, or as the Stasi called it, Operation Denver. This was an active measures campaign run by the KGB in the 1980s to plant the idea that the United States had invented HIV AIDS as part of a biological weapons research project. The crux of the operation involved several active measures techniques, including article placement in a pro-Soviet news newspaper in India called the Patriot and agents of influence in the form of East German biologist Jacob Siegel and his wife, Dr. Lily Siegel, who published a pamphlet supporting the theory and accusing the US government of a cover-up. The story went viral the way any story could go viral in the 1980s, which meant that it was reprinted and shared widely by newspapers and governments. The technique of planting stories, relying on lower tier publications and on witting or unwitting freelancers or agents of influence can be seen across a number of operations run by IO threat actors today, including from Iran and Russia. In May, 2019, Facebook removed an Iranian network they used a small number of fake accounts posing as journalists and other fictitious personas to seed and amplify their content. FireEye and Facebook researchers saw personas in the network leverage media outlets in the US and in Israel to promote Iranian interests through the submission of letters, guest columns, and guest posts. The example here is a letter published in the Galveston County's Daily News written by one of the personas in the network. More recently, we saw an IRA-linked effort ahead of the 2020 election that involved setting up two websites posing as news outlets at the opposite ends of the political spectrum. Um, that's the famous example of Peace Data and NAEBC.com. They recruited freelance journalists, including people in the US and in Europe, to write on social and political issues targeting the both, both the left and the right. Next slide. In his memoirs, former KGB operative Oleg Kalugin said that they always tried to place stories in newspapers in developing nations where journalists could be easily manipulated or bribed to publish a story. The news clip on the top right of the slide was the result of a forged dispatch appearing to be from the German embassy in Accra, Ghana, allegedly reporting on an American ambassador who was complaining about how slow it was to overthrow the government in Ghana. The story ended up in the Ghanaian press and the US had to convince the Ghanaian government that this was a fabrication. But when Soviet active measures didn't rely on leveraging the news media, they found success with sponsoring front organizations and fake NGOs. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union maintained a network of international organizations purporting to be NGOs with common causes like peace building and non-proliferation. Some famous examples include the World Peace Council and the World Federation of Democratic Youth. So fast forward to 2020, and we have a lot of the same things. We have Ghana, we have fake NGOs, and we have front organizations and publications. One IRA-associated operation in 2020 employed people in Ghana at a troll farm posing as a fictitious NGO in Accra called Eliminating Barriers for the Liberation of Africa. It focused on divisive and racially charged narratives in the United States, and the operation appeared to be outsourcing its activity in an effort to appear more credible. This operation was exposed by researchers at Facebook, um, on the ground reporting by Clarissa Ward and her team at CNN, and by researchers at Graphica and Clemson University. The other image here from the US Treasury Department is from the US Treasury Department's April 2021 sanction statement. 
outlining the relationship between several different Russian intelligence agencies and websites posing as outlets or fronting as think tanks. Some of these include the Strategic Culture Foundation, Newsfront, Southfront, and others. Next slide. So what can we derive from all of these parallels between history and today and the operations that we've seen throughout time? So we can talk a lot about how operations have evolved over time, how we've seen threat actors adapt. And one of the things that we've seen is that we can learn a lot from the study of history and historical influence operations. So as a professor, I'm sort of required to tell you that studying history is important. The second thing is that we're increasingly seeing threat actors relying on analog techniques because their wholesale scaled operations are getting caught, because blurring the lines between authentic and inauthentic engagement and outsourcing to other players is cheaper and looks more credible. And because these techniques create more distance between the operator and the operation. Third, these analog methods are more expensive and often less, less, less effective for these IO threat actors. They're not getting as much reach because they're relying on these analog methods that they've been using for decades. And fourth and finally, importantly for this group, there's a lot we can do together as a defender community to educate, to build deterrence and to catch these campaigns before they can have an impact. And some of that relies on our study of history, and some of that relies on our work to collaborate with one another through a community of research like we have here today. So thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been wonderful um, working with all of you, and I can, would love to continue the conversation. And to continue the conversation around history, I'm going to pass things over to my colleague and friend, Ben Nimmo, who leads threat intelligence investigations into these influence operations at Facebook.